On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at Direct at gmail.com, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing very well. How are you today? Great to hear. I am doing well as well, Lance. And today for this episode, it's really, it's going to be a two-parter, two episodes in a row. Here in this interview today, we speak to a community member named Ryan Coyalto, who has been messaging us and has really put together some interesting thoughts on the disappearance of Maura Murray, and specifically Butch Atwood and his moves that night. Yeah, Ryan is a great example of those in the community that is very thorough, and he's capable of having a, a dialogue, a good back and forth about a theory. Um, I personally don't subscribe to his theory about Butch, and I don't think we're trying to push any particular theory about Butch on this episode. For me personally, it was more of a exploration into his thought process because through all the messages that he's been sending us, it was clear that he's very detailed and organized and, and about as well researched as he can be up to this point. It was really about that. And it was about having that dialogue, having a particular theory and talking to people who don't have the same theory or are trying to say, well, okay, you, you said this, how does that line up with um, what's in the police report, for example, and just hear what he has to say and not have it turn into an argument or anything where people walk away from feeling like they were attacked. Yeah, and Ryan does a pretty good job with that. And uh, in fairness, we've gotten questions about doing more on Butch Atwood for a long time. So I guess uh, you can finally say we've heard you and uh, and listened. And this is this is it because um, again, Lance, w- with you, I, you know, I'm not I'm not so sure. I believe Butch did anything wrong that night. Uh, I know there have been some inconsistencies throughout the years about what he said and what he did and things like that. But um, it's probably mostly due to uh, different accounts and memory. But again, I don't know. You know, we, we talk about that a lot on the on the show and you just never really know. So it's interesting talking to Ryan and getting his thoughts on uh, on the theory of Butch Atwood or just, just looking at Butch a little bit more. All right, thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Part two will be out Monday. And check us out tonight on Get Vocal. That's Thursday, September 24th. We are doing a Maura Murray night tonight, 9 p.m. on Get Vocal, 9 p.m. Eastern. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan Catello. How are you today? Hey guys, I'm well. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for uh, joining us on uh, what you described as a uh, on a hot day. I think you're in a hot environment, so um, thank you for taking you know time out of your day to uh, to do this with us um, and and put yourself through this uh, this heat wave. <laughs> and um, behind you, I we're 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 doing this on Zoom. I want everyone to know. And behind Ryan is uh, are some diagrams, maps, printed up maps, drawn maps, and what looks like the um like the the accident report, perhaps. Um, but this this is all in reference to Moore's crash and uh, primarily Butch Atwood. And this is your theory. 
that's correct. Um, and it's not that um, Butch Atwood killed Mora. So I don't want everyone to just run away from this now based on that. Um, this is that Butch Atwood was a helpful guy. And uh, she asked for his help because I think that's what she would have done rather than wait for, for AAA. And there's other reasons I think that. I grew up in a small town that looks exactly like that. Like um, most of the bus drivers knew the cops, knew the um, you know paramedics and so forth. Everyone kind of knew each other. And I think that that's part of the dynamic that was missing uh, when people had looked at this case before. Um, yeah. People think that when a neighbor's like the last person to see someone alive, the police in the city will definitely look at the neighbor very strongly. But in a smaller town, um, the weight of what the neighbor says uh, holds a lot of, um, you know, it holds a lot of, uh, I don't know, value to the local officials, especially when you share coffees with them, have beers with them and that sort of thing. And I just feel like that aspect has really been missing from this case. And, and I wanted to kind of, you know, just explain my view on this through the timeline. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, you've been sort of a uh, familiar face on uh, in the Twitter sphere, I guess, for uh, for maybe a good year or so now. Um, you popped into one of our live Get Vocal nights recently. That was great um, to see you. We were very excited because you look exactly like your photo on Twitter, so that's always refreshing. Um, so, uh, so welcome, uh, to, to the podcast and, uh, I guess, but before we jump into it, let's, uh, I'm, I'm curious what got you into the case. Um, so I'm an area rep. I just, I sell windows for work. That's what I do and doors and high, high performance windows and doors. And so occasionally I have to travel from the towns three, four hours away. And so I was looking for a podcast that was going to take me there and back and maybe the next trip next week. And that's, I saw your guys had a lot of content and I thought, okay, this is great. It also popped up a lot. Um, so maybe you guys were advertising a lot or maybe, uh, you know, the algorithm was just figuring out what I wanted to hear. Um, but once I had listened to like 14, I just could not stop because I had formulated a theory by then already. And to, to see people not coming back to it, it started driving me nuts. So then I picked up Renner's book. I wrote up something for Renner after uh, I finished his book. Uh, he kind of hit me back and was like, he goes, thanks for sharing your thoughts. <laughs> so I knew that was pretty bad theory. And also I couldn't explain the police activity back then. Um, but now I can. And that's why I feel really strong about the theory now. And since, since I've been able to explain the police activity, I kind of was kicking it around with the prosecutors. And Brett told me there was a great theory. And after he told me that, I said, um, okay, maybe I should share this because I didn't want to because I know how it sounds to think that I can offer something to a 15 year old cold case. And I know it sounds ridiculous. Um, but when Brett said it was a good theory, that's why I just thought, okay, maybe it's time to share this. So, Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it's not ridiculous. I mean, this is what we're trying to do is to uh, talk things through and to make them um, more into a presentation, more into something where people can uh, consume it and, and comprehend it. And then, either provide positive feedback or some, you know, constructive criticism. I think, I think this is great. Yeah. And, you know, Butch is also a, a, a guy who he, well, he's the last person to have seen her. Right. So that's, there's always some suspicion there. Um, and I remember long ago we heard from Nancy Grace who was like, yeah, usually anyone who calls the police isn't uh, guilty, but also in doing what we've done now for over five years, like uh, we know that that's not true in every case. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, so tell us a little bit about how you came to, uh, to this, this uh, theory, or I guess, I guess just take us through it. Okay. Yeah. So how I, how I came to it and I knew that it was, uh, it was, I knew that there was something here was because I am a philosophy major. And uh, so, you know, our kind of our job in that process to get that degree is to find the, the most reasonable explanation for things. And I can see that very clearly in every different story that I've heard about this story. And um, the other thing is like the truth matters to philosophy people. And so, um, you know, words matter and the words have meaning. And so when you, um, you know, twist words or, 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 um, or providing consistencies that can't be explained. Sometimes those inconsistencies, con consistencies create a narrative. And sometimes you build facts off of that narrative. And um, when you do that, it, things become really hopeless and you can never get back to, to square one. And so I don't have any investigative background or anything, but I can certainly, I certainly know an inconsistency when I see one. And I think that um, that explains a lot of why there's been no progress on this case. 
is because of those. And I'll get into those. Great. Um, so you you also sent us a uh, a report that says what I believe happened to Maura Murray. Um, is that uh, the guidelines that you want to follow during this conversation? That would have been the same thing I probably sent Renner. So it's a little uh-huh. outdated at this point. Yeah. Oh, is but it? Okay. No, I, I, this has been, this is a rewrite. I have, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll take you through, I'll, I'll, I'll set the premise up. I'll take you through the timeline. We'll stop mid timeline. And then I'll give you what something I've posted on Reddit, which is uh, 23 reasons more got on Butch's bus. I'll give you the short and sweet of that. And those were the 23 reasons and the 23 outliers and the inconsistencies that I attribute to Butch that got me starting to think about this angle. And so then we'll carry on with the timeline and finish with where I think it would be a good idea to look for if anyone thinks this is a credible theory. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. We do need to build off of uh, a premise. So that's important. And uh, I use the premise that uh, Moore did in fact hit the treat Bassey. And I'm not, I'm not judging anything here. Um, I think that partly why I feel like I can relate to this case is because uh, I've made a lot of the similar mistakes that Moore made at 20 and 21. And the only difference is that I uh, had an opportunity to outgrow them and stuff and more I did. And so I just want anyone from the family who might listen to, to understand that I'm trying to be very clinical and I don't think that more is a bad person at all. And I definitely don't think she's a sociopath. If anything, she just is really good at asking her friends to do things for her. And she's the type of person that you want to help. So she, she's not a sociopath. So um, I, I work from the premise that more hit Vassy and that's why she's going to white mountains. Personally, I can't imagine doing schoolwork if the kid I had just hit was still in a coma. So I would need to get rid of the car. Absolutely. I think we all would. And I think Fred asked more to come to UMass and bring four grand. It's enough to get a new car or get her out of the country. I don't know if she knew what she probably didn't tell him on the phone, but he did it cause he's a dad. So he just plowed through and got her the money. Um, and, um, when he got there though, Fred realized how bad it would look if more was driving a new car. Plus there's getting rid of the old car. So it becomes kind of problematic. So someone, I think, came up with the idea that Saturday afternoon over drinks about writing off the car by rolling it, you know, down a small hill in the parking lot at the base of a mountain hike. A little bit of conjecture on how they do it, or a little bit of me implying, but this seems totally reasonable. Um, And I think that Fred is a really, really intelligent guy, and everyone has underestimated Fred a lot. So I think this plan was already in the works, and and I'm going to get there. I didn't start here. Um, but I'm going to get to why. Um, so <clears throat> she wanted to write off the car um, out of state. So it would be difficult to prove that the damage was caused by Vassy when he woke up. You know, there's a whole, how do you get a, a totally wrecked car back to Massachusetts? Um, ideally, the hill would be steep, the bat, damage bad, and the car gets written off and kept it driven back. So she, we know she called a hotel in Vermont the day she went missing. But being that it was a hotel, they probably required a credit card. And not only did she not want to leave a record, she probably didn't have one because of the fraud issue. So that's when she decided she needed a hostel, and that's when she took out all her money. So I think Mora was headed east on Wild Diamond Newsick, um, aka 112, to North Woodstock or Lincoln. That seems like the most reasonable thing to me because there's lots of hotels, motels, and there's a few hostels in North Woodstock. It's a very travel like town. So it would be accommodating to someone with 100 bucks or less. And so if she had 200, arguably she's living rich. Like, you know, like snowboarders will go to these places with a bag of weed and last three months sometimes. Like, you don't need a lot of money, I would argue, but beside a mountain, you know? Anyways, I think it was just for the weekend because she was getting some more cash from her other jobs. And so uh, Loon Mountain's there. Uh, there's other mountains there. It's a great, like a, you can get a hostel for like 30 bucks a night. Uh, there's even a Franconia Notch, which is something your, um, you know, your psychic mentioned, but I don't want to go down that road. Anyways, I think that it's perfectly reasonable. I don't think she took the wrong turn and was going somewhere else. I think she took the right turn. Because post uh, or pre uh, Google Maps, I wouldn't really split hairs over like what gets you the fastest. I would remember the easiest way. I would put like 91 right on 302 turns into 112, right? Or whatever. I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't write down like six different turns for myself on a napkin. I would just remember two highways. So I think she was on the right highway um, because I think she was going to the uh, snowboarder town. Uh, Okay. So. She's 29 minutes from where I think she's headed to spend the night. So that's, I think, when she starts to drink. Because anyone who has a roadie doesn't have it when they're two hours from where they got to be. Because if they have one more, then they're going to be over or whatever. So I think she's probably just keeping it reasonable. She's in an area now where it's basically 40 kilometers to Woodstock. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I might have missed it. You said she, you think she was going to Woodstock? Yes. Okay. Because that's at the end of 112. 
Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's what it turns into, the first town it turns into. And so she's 29 minutes from Woodstock when she turns onto 112. And that's when I think reasonably she might start to have a, a bit to drink. Um, okay. I don't want to say she was drinking all the way from UMass. And I doubt it she was because I don't think it, that's reasonable. Um, but after 10 minutes, which is about where she'd be in her drive, I think that you start to have a little bit of alcohol kick in. And you get like some renewed sense of confidence that maybe was missing the last couple of days. And again, that's just me, me um, projecting or not projecting, but basically imagining what would be most reasonable. So at 726, more crashes. Now we could probably put that earlier, but we'll use what we know because um, I think it's reasonable to use what we know um, as opposed to infer that maybe she was there at 715. So she had to have crashed at 726 uh, at the latest because Faith calls a uh, 911 next. So at 726, um, uh, Faith Westman calls, um, or excuse me, at 726, more crashes. So the seatbelt thing from uh, the prosecutor's pod, it told me that uh, it was more in the car because there's evidence of repeating similar behavior that she's not learned from. She had speeding tickets before. She got into the accident with the Toyota. She appeared to have been drinking in this case. And so I argue she had to have been drinking because there's no reason to avoid the police if you slide into the ditch in another state. It's not like she's a wanted person. So that's my first thing. I think she was probably drinking. Uh, Renner does too. Crashing uh, could not have been planned. Like a strategic hitman, AKA the man smoking a cigarette, uh, would surely have wore his seatbelt prior to staging a crash. Um, because then you never know if he's gonna even live while he's staging this crash. He got away the seatbelt. So she probably was speeding around the corner as per Mora. Uh, so if she w was, she would certainly probably smack her head as the car came to rest. I'm not saying she broke the window, but I just think there's no way you can't because that's exactly what seatbelts are designed to do, especially when you come to a stop sliding sideways. Your body keeps going. It has to. So um, Fred also says during the 2004 search that she may have an, a head injury based on analysis of the window. So it's 726. More has crashed. She's got a, a little bit of a shakeup. 727, Faith calls 911. Faith reports a call is spun out off the road. Moore is severely disoriented. Um, there may have been a soft thud as the car comes to rest against the snowbank. I mean, if we close our eyes and picture a car sliding, coming to a sudden stop against the snowbank, I don't think you can imagine that without a sound. And further, James Renner says that Faith Westman said she heard a crash. So if you don't like James Renner's theory, I use it a lot here. I think it's, I think it's the best evidence we have later. But he's also interviewing people directly. And uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of nonsense on the internet oh there couldn't have been a crash there was no thought it's i think it's nonsense i think there was a crash because that's what faith said that's why she called 911 i don't think james renner would lie about that so um more is disoriented uh, there may have been a thud um we know whatever more was drinking sprayed all over the car i would say more takes a minute to gather herself and realizing she's stuck she uh, accelerates aggressively and loudly trying to get out of the ditch and that's what everyone would do because as soon as you're stuck you're going to try and get out without any physical labor you're gonna try and get the car out itself. So you'd hear a thud, you'd hear a ton of acceleration. Okay, 728, Moore gets out of the car, walks around and starts to dig out the back tires. Now the back left tire, maybe being slightly in the ditch, puts the front tires up on an upward incline from the slope of the ditch. I checked and the Saturns um, were front wheel drive, so Moore didn't drive away initially, probably because she just couldn't get traction on the front tires. That's why there was no indication of her spinning out the tires a lot. So if she's up on an incline, the tires are just gonna spin almost in the air. They might make a little, little like wet spot on the road. Okay, um, 729, Mora opens up her cell phone, holds it right up to her face. Um, if it's the Sprint phone, it would look more like a cigarette because flipped open, the red light is up. If it's a Samsung, I still offer it would look like a cigarette because I've had that phone. I think Lance mentioned you have. Um, when she finds there's no service, uh, you know, she probably puts it down. I'm sure she would check this a few times. So you can actually, actually really easily put this later in the timeline, but I'm going to put it 729 for now only because I would check for service rather. So Faith Westman reports a man smoking a cigarette in the context of her age. That's what her mind can rationalize. A red blinking light in the distance is a cigarette before it's a cell phone to a 70 year old. Uh, it should be added that Tim Westman thinks it's a woman with a cell phone. Like the husband thinks the opposite. Um, and if Morris' hair is up, as it always is, then the silhouette version of her looks like a man. So Faith's comment is actually consistent with what we would expect of Mora. Faith is making a general guess from about 30 meters away at night. Okay. So I think we must assume that it was a woman at the car and not a man because Butch confirms later that it was Mora. Um, but now we're at 7.30 to 7.32. 
And I use a three minute timeline for Butch because that's what John Healy, the detective with the most hours on the case, according to James Renner, puts it at three to five minutes. Butch Atwood puts his own uh, timeline possibility at seven to nine minutes, which is very convenient for Butch Atwood. But I'm going to go with three minutes because that's what John Healy thinks. So now we have Butch Atwood. It's 7.30 to 7.32. Um, we're assuming that it's a woman because Butch says that it's a woman. Butch says Maura's hair is down, which is not what we'd expect to hear because it's outside the norm for Maura, right? Um, that's not a big deal. And a lot of people say it could have fallen out. But it's one of those things we got to give to Butch. It's outside the norm. You know what I mean? The hair down statement by Butch is what makes us suspect that there were two people at the scene. Not because Faith is lying about what she thinks she saw from a distance, but because Butch is lying about what he knows he saw up close. If Butch would have said Mora's hair was up, we would have made the connection between Faith's man description and Mora with her hair up much sooner. So here's what I think that would have happened reasonably with the conversation. Butch rolls up, says, you okay? Mora says, yes. Uh, she's probably crying. Um, Butch says, need some help, I can call someone. But Morris says, no, I have a cell phone I can call for help. Now, in every reasonable scenario on earth except for this one, the old man tells the young girl there's no service in this area because he's trying to actually be helpful. So if she says she's going to get a call out, he's going to say, look, you won't get service for 10 miles east or 10 miles west, okay? And so that's what I think Butch would have said. I think he told her there was no service in the area. Um, regardless though, Maura wouldn't want to wait around for AAA, not after she's been drinking and not when she's up to whatever she's up to. So she would have simply asked Butch, I'm fine. Can you push my car back onto the road with me? Now the, the bus is blocking Faith Westman and the Murat's view and Butch, um, and John Healy, uh, says in Renner's book that Butch gave three different accounts of what happened that night. In one account, he gets out in one account, he stays in one account. He's out with his flashlight. So John Healy has a real problem with that. And I have found articles that suggest Butch is flying, uh, you know, shining his flashlight in. So I feel like he probably got out, but he doesn't like to let that on later. Now, here's why I think he got out. Um, it doesn't have to happen for this timeline to make sense. But if it's true, it explains a lot. It explains the rag in the tailpipe and the black handprint on the window. So um, here's why. Butch is getting smoked out from the exhaust. Because you can't you can't accelerate that Saturn, according to Fred, heavily without getting tons of black smoke. So Maura's probably just being polite. This guy's helping her. She knows what to do. She grabs a rag from the trunk, stuffs it in the tailpipe so Butch doesn't have to get smoke blowing in his face. Yeah, so, I mean, if Butch tried to help her out, I don't think that Maura would just let him stand there and get smoked out. I think she would help him by stuffing the rag in the tailpipe. And, I mean, that's a way to explain it with no malice by the police, which I, I believe is the case. Uh, okay, so... Regardless of what happens now when Butch stops, regardless of what happens, uh, the bus door is open and they hear Cecil Smith confirm to John Monaghan over the bus's two-way radio that he's almost on scene at the Weathered Barn corner. So I checked into this too and the radio frequencies in Grafton, they appear to be separated regionally as opposed to by service, even to this day. So in other words, the ambulance, the police, the bus drivers, they all use the same frequency. So Butch would have known Cecil was almost at the Saturn while he was talking to Mora. You researched that back then, the ambulance, the police, like all of the, all of those uh, services, and including bus drivers who use a, a two-way radio with the school system, they all operate on the same frequency? That's right. In fact, there's only a few states where the, bu the school system is separate from the police. Wow. So, so you're saying Butch, Butch heard every police call? I think he did. I think he did. I think he heard every police call from his bus while he was on the way. And, and the only reason I looked into that, because that's the way they were set up when, where I grew up. That's the way they ran. So the, the bus would coordinate with the police and stuff, you know, traffic stops up ahead and that sort of thing. Yeah. How did you uh, confirm that? Well, I haven't confirmed it. And that's where I'm not. I mean, I found it on the internet and it appears that they have highway department. It's like Grafton Northeast, Grafton Southwest, Grafton. Like it, it, it's, it's regional, right? And then I looked like, is this typical? And I found that um, they were all praising how in Florida, they had successfully moved the, um, the school division fleet of buses off of the local emergency crews. And that was like the way they wanted to do every state because it would be less confusing. So if that's the case, and, that, and you can confirm that that was the case back then, then, someone would, then Butch would have to say his bus radio was off for him not to hear what was going on. And I think that that's not very reasonable, so. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
so I think that if Mora's car was really spinning on the front tires, all Butch would have to do being a big heavy guy is put a little pressure on the front, get the tires back down and just push it backwards. I don't want to say that that happens, but I kind of think it happens because of the police report, it puts her actually more on the road when the tire tracks are more in front of her and everyone else says she's really far from the corner. And furthermore, it might explain why the Marats saw uh, reverse lights out the corner of their eye. Because when Mora reversed past the front of the bus with the back of her car, he would have saw those reverse lights and that would have caught his eye when he hadn't seen them before. So I think that it's possible that Butch actually helped just give her a little push back a couple inches and she, you know, it probably was easier than getting way into the ditch against the snowbank and pushing her forward. Uh, depending on how the car was, like I guess we'll never know. But um, so yeah, that's where I think that 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 leaves off. Um, so now that Morris' car's back on the road and the police are incoming, Butch starts home. So one problem: Morris can't start a car. I think it's a safety feature that threw her off. I've had this problem in my own life where I tried like twice and like walked away for an hour and tried again, and I was like, okay, this, this is happening now. Um, so I think that that might be what happened. And it, even if she tried three times. Even if she starts it on the fourth, she's going to have to turn it around. So I think she's probably like, you know, the cops are coming from this way. Um, and she can see their lights now. She'll have like a one minute heads up from the channel of projecting the lights. She might even have a two minute heads up, depending on how icy the snow banks are in February. And if it can throw light reflectively around the corner. I don't know. I think by the time she sees lights, she's she's got at that point. I don't think um, because those those roads are so windy and kind of hilly too. What do you think of, about that, Lance? We even heard from Kara McNamara when she was talking about um, how the cruiser or the police car uh, had passed her and was going up over the hills, and she said you could you could see it. She was like, I, even though it was out of my view, I could see the the lights still going up, you know, up and down. Um, and I just wanted to say real quick, uh, there's, there's always, we always kind of stumble on ourselves when we were talking about which direction her car was facing. Uh, no, 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 we do it. We do it too. I just wanted to confirm that her car is facing West cause she was, she was coming from the West and her car spun around and it was facing the direction that she was coming from. So the taillights were facing East towards the Marats, towards the Bath, um, town, town line. Thanks, yeah. uh, Lance. I didn't <laughs> write that down, and it got me. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, it's okay. It, I, yeah, that one's got us uh, a lot over the years. Um, but yeah, the, yeah. So she was she was in the eastbound lane facing west. Um, and also, I think she tried to start her car more than three times. I thought it was like, it was like eight. seven. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I'm that. gonna get to that. We'll, okay. we'll circle back. Yeah. Okay. So she tries, um, but then when she sees, maybe she only has a, a minute or thirty second lead time, but more is fast. When she sees the lights in her front uh, view, she sees Butch Atwood about to back up in her back view. And she realizes she still has an opportunity to avoid this police officer and avoid this ticket. She sees the bus coming to a halt at Bradley Hill Road behind her, the police lights approaching from the front. Uh, keep in mind, Maura didn't mind being seen by the Westmans, the Merritts, or the Atwoods. Only when the police were nearby did she disappear. So 7.33, Butch stops at Bradley Hill Road to begin backing down his driveway. Maura flicks on her headlights, grabs a couple main items, including her backpack and the Kahlua. Because of the light in the trunk and the speed at which she's moving, it looks like a flurry of activity. She may even try her phone one more time here. Could be a cell phone here. Maura uh, runs to the door of the bus and begs to hide out for a second. Now, Butch has helped her once, so statistically speaking, he'll help her a second time. Uh, this is called like the link in effect or something. If you walk into a salesperson's office and they ask you to pass them a pen, don't do it because you'll probably end up buying something from them. If you do someone a favor, you're conditioned right off the first one. So I think that if Butch offered to help her and he did help her in any way, when she runs through his window crying, a young girl, he's going to say, okay, because he knows the cops, I think. So, uh, well, I know he knows the cops. I just think that he would say yes. So um, statistically speaking, he'll agree the second time. I figure that even without the radio heads up, which I think they had, um, more, more I had about a one minute heads up from the police lights coming around the corner from the West. So I'm going to take a guess here that the black out part of uh, Faith Westman's 911 phone call is her telling the dispatcher that the driver seems okay, is walking around the car and possibly smoking. 734, Cecil's coming around the corner, slow, so as not to hit anyone, but also slow because Morris' headlights are facing at him now, thanks to Butch. 
which is uh, actually just safe, so that's fine. He's focused on Moore's obvious position car and the headlights pointing at him. So he barely misses Butch's bus backing into the driveway. Butch might have already been down for 30 seconds, but regardless, you're not going to see anything past those headlights for a second. So um, uh, he barely misses Butch's bus. Butch can easily see the blue lights of the police car from his bus through the tr pine trees surrounding the house. That's something John Healy told us. I'm not making that up. John Healy puts that in Renner's book. And so John Healy knows Butch can see the crime scene. So anyone on the internet that wants to say, oh, he couldn't see this and that, I don't buy it because John Healy didn't buy it. So, Yeah, it is it's it is still debatable. I don't know. Uh, we just put out some drone video of uh, the crash site. You could see um, that, you know, even if he did have a direct line, um, and he might have with the, there being less trees in the winter time, but right now I don't think you could do it like in the summertime. Um, but even if you had that direct view, it's a far away. It's like, I don't know. It's like at least a couple of football fields, I think. So here's the thing. Um, the, the shop that's on site now, I've been talking to the locals a bit, um, hate to admit that. Um, but, uh, the shop is not the same shop. The very small bus shop that Butch used to have has been taken down, and that's a new shop on that corner. Um, also, uh, the new owner took down a lot of pine trees uh, that used to surround the house. And um, I'll just say that John Healy is making a point about not seeing the crime scene directly. He's making a point about seeing blue lights. Um, we'll get back to that, too. So I just want to go back. I just want to go back real quick to the um, <clears throat> to the redacted part of the uh, uh, call from Faith Westman. You said that it was blacked out, and your your theory is it was blacked out because uh, Faith said, "No, I'm watching this person walk around the car. Does not appear to be injured, and that's why they didn't send out um, EMS." I just want to give a little context before that. So this was the call, the Grafton County Dispatcher. Uh, answers and she says, uh, you know, can I help you? Faith says, yes. Um, apparently we've we've uh, a car has gone off the road here outside our home. And then the uh, Grafton County dispatcher says, okay, is anybody hurt? And Faith says, um, I I have not gone out to investigate. Um, and then the Grafton County dispatcher says, okay. And that's right after that is when that part's blacked out. So it does fit in with your theory that they're talking about somebody, whether they're hurt or not. Um, and and that, that's, what it, uh, that's what your theory is. Uh, right after that, it says, are you in, you're in Bath, correct? And then she says where she is by the weathered barn. So just the context around that. But, but an ambulance did end up arriving. Yep, and we'll get okay. there. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, thanks, Lance. Uh, appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think that it would follow after, after uh, Faith says, you know, I didn't go outside. Dispatcher says, okay. Faith would try to offer what she can, right? I, I can see them walking around or whatever. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a solid theory as to what is redacted there because um, some people might be thinking, well, maybe she gave her address and the address is redacted. That's, that's later on in this dispatch log as well. So it does actually have a spot where they, at, they confirm her address and they redact it. So that's not the redacted part that we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, at 7.35, or excuse me, um, we're still at 7.34. Cecil's trying to understand the scene. He thinks the car looks almost drivable. Can't find Mora. He heads back to look at the weathered barn, which he says he does, and Merritt's confirmed. Uh, and he's kind of just like on the other side of the road. He's just not next to his car. Let's put it that way. So at 7.35, Karen McNamara, witness A, drives by the scene and notices SUV 001 nose to nose with the Saturn. So witness A describes the scene looking almost exactly as Faith Westman did, except the car seems to be more on the shoulder than in the ditch. Uh, Faith said the car spun. Karen said it was facing the wrong way. Their similar description should say something because Butch has already passed by at this time. So as Karen drives by, she's looking right and Cecil is left near the old weather barn or, or whatever, you, however you want, behind, right? So Karen stops at the end of Atwood's driveway Due to having an extremely strong intuition that she needed to help somehow, she looked back and saw the police car and carried on. Karen was right. She was physically closer to Mora at the end of Atwood's driveway than she was next to Mora's own car. I mean, in my opinion, this is where witness A would have stopped. And she stops and looks back for a moment, thinking I need to help. And she's like, what am I gonna do? The police are, are gone. So witness A carries on with her life. 
At 7.36 to 7.38, Cecil's visiting the Westman's house. So he's done with the weathered, or excuse me, he's done with the weathered barn. He's over at the Westman's. Um, looks around and then heads back to the car. At 7.39, after further inspection, Cecil starts to develop a theory that the driver is avoiding a DUI. He probably discovers the rag, which takes another minute to process. Maura and Atwood are sitting on the bus listening to Cecil correspond with dispatch when they realize it'll only be a matter of time before Cecil drives to Atwood's. 7.40, Butch formulates a plan. At 7.41, Cecil decides there's nobody at the Saturn and he radios to dispatch that he'll go check the Atwoods. 7.42, Cecil makes his way to the Atwoods residence as Butch is running into the house to call 911 to report the accident. I mean, Cecil might've been already making his way two minutes earlier, but, or one minute earlier. It's really hard to tell when Cecil left this area, but it was certainly before 7.46 and I'll get there. So um, Cecil makes his way to the Atwoods. At 7.43, Butch's 911 call comes in. And this is where it's really, really important to, where everything, where the, the uh, inconsistencies begin to shape the case. And this is really important. So Atwood, Atwood says, I'd like to report an accident. He hit a pine tree. And so I wanna argue that four really, really important things happen here. One, it's the first time that we see that Atwood's bold enough to lie to officials. He says he instead of she. And people will say, oh, that's probably just a typo. That, in fact, that requires us to infer that the 911 dispatcher did their job wrong or made a typo or you know, wrote something down wrong. So if we're gonna infer that, we're giving Atwood another outlier. He said he, I think it was written down exactly as he said it, hit a tree. So first of all, Atwood puts a tree on the scene. It wasn't there before. And what's worse than the tree is it's the wrong kind of tree. So one is it's he, she, Two, it's a tree now instead of a spin out or a ditch. And three, it's a pine tree. Now that's an oddly specific detail to get wrong, okay? So the fourth thing that's happened, he, she, it's a tree. There was no tree arguably on the scene. The tree is wrong, it's a pine tree. The fourth thing, Atwood's now excused the damage to the car that the spin out wouldn't have caused. Namely, a pine tree could cause damage to the hood, but the tree were accustomed to seeing a blue ribbon on could not have caused the damage to the hood with the indent on top. And that's what John Healy's case was always, like John Healy always says she probably hit a, the back of a car, like a semi or something, because he doesn't like the crime scene, right? The black box tells us there was two impacts and we'll get there, so it couldn't have been a semi. Um, John Healy, hired and working for Fred, is required not to look too closely at the, the crime scene for a reason, um, because, you know, like John Healy's job is not to, is to find Mora. It's not to get Mora charged with something extra, right? So Fred would not like if she was in trouble for something like getting to treat Bassey. So now that after Butch has passed by and made his 911 call, it's on record now an excuse for the damage. And Butch actually takes the time to say there was damage to the car um, and that the airbags were pulled out. And this is really crucial uh, for Mora. So, uh, so this is when I realized Butch and Mora were working together. Uh, the tree is crucial to Mora's story as it stands now. And that's why certain people in the community will go to great lengths to defend the tree and keep it in the story. So I checked and other people have checked. And from everything I can tell, the Saturns have two airbags, both in the front, on the left and on the right. So that's it. If there's no tree, then there's no airbag. And if there's no airbag, you got to put the crash somewhere else. And if you got to put the crash somewhere else, it's likely back at UMass a few turns of the engine ago. And if you've got to put the crash back at UMass, then you've probably got to put, I mean, somebody hit Vassy and left the scene, right? Like people can say that doesn't happen, but it happened this time and there's still no one to account for it. So I think that the tree coming into the story is super, super important for Mora because I, I have a suspicion that it's, it was part of the plan made on Saturday. If you roll a car down a hill and it hits the bottom of a pine tree, you're going to be able to excuse that damage. So there's two tenths of a second between the impacts, in between impacts one and two. And the impact must have happened at 20 to 30 miles per hour. So the speed was extremely low with little to no possible injury. So if Mora spun out on this ditch and had two impacts to a tree somehow that popped her airbag, this would have been like another outlier where she's actually driving seemingly under the speed limit around that corner. I think that this, this whole Butch reporting, he hit a pine tree is key. It's a key inconsistency that the entire case has been built off of. 
and this whole tree business. Once you eliminate the tree, James Renner doesn't like the tree. He went to a local TV repairman who was also the emergency responder that night. The emergency spawn responder has to put the impact that caused the damage on the corner here. And then she spins around and gets, because the emergency responder can't rationalize how the damage happened, right? Right. Okay. I just want to, um, that's a, that's a lot to, uh, to unpack. It's a lot to process. Uh, so I, I just, I just want to, um, bring us uh, back to center here uh, on what you're talking about. Uh, the, the mistake he makes when he says, or the mistake that's in the dispatch log when he says he, um, he says, uh, you got a single car motor vehicle accident. He hit a pine tree. You're saying that he makes that mistake, not because there's actually a man there. He makes that mistake because, uh, him and Mora are now talking about how to make this look like she hit a tree. Right. So, so, so he, he it, the, he isn't specific to, you know, there's a man here. He just, he's just going with the flow as Mora's telling him what to say. And he misspeaks. Because later on in the transcript, he does describe Mora. He does say that, you know, he, he, he describes um, that she was shaken up. She, there was no blood. Uh, the airbag was deployed. Um, so he does say she later on in the transcript. Um, that's really interesting information about the black box, the time between the hits. So that's, that's really interesting information. Uh, I, one, one problem that I can't, like I'm trying to wrap my head around, is Mora gets into this accident, Right. This isn't a staged ac- accident. She gets. She's actually in the accident. The airbag is actually deployed, and she does actually hit her head. And and she, there. And she has been drinking. So there are moments where, in your theory, she's she's dazed and doesn't really know. You know, just kind of like, um, kind of processing the accident as anyone would. Uh, but then in your theory, there are other moments where you know she's now thinking on uh, thinking on the fly she's she knows she's got a certain amount of time to get away from the car she's she goes up to butch because she knows he offered help once he'll do it again um and then she comes up with this whole plan in like in like a minute and a half or something um so that that's the only like that's the thing i'm just trying to wrap my head around how how are you wrapping your head around that like she's she's dazed from the hit from the accident but she's still capable of making these decisions she actually didn't make the decision there. The plan was already in place Saturday night. Um, so all she had to do was fall back onto it and ask Butch to inject it into the story. But if, if she had hit Vasi and the two hits, you know, knocks on the black box were there, but then how, like, why isn't there uh, anything on the black box for the accident in Haverhill? Okay. Yeah. Keep going. It, yeah. It does strike me as, as, um, hard to hard to kind of get, get you know go with that they're making a plan right there on the spot yeah i think that that the reason i really feel strongly about that is because i think that that's the type of person Mora was is that there are certain people that can ask for something and make you feel a part of something and and, and get you to want to help and so i think that's when Mora said like look i'm not going to be able to go back to that car Right. And that's where she was just like, I just got to do this now. And if I can just get out of the area, I'm almost running distance to Woodstock. If I can just get to Woodstock, I'll be in shelter. And so I think that Mora would have had to, you know, avoid the DUI, sleep at Butch's house, and then figure out how to get her car in Haverhill the next day. And if it were me, and if I already had a plan, I would just speed it up. If I was already going to go to the mountains and write off my car by sliding it down it, like, the way I picture this happening is you just have the e-brake on, on a little bit of a hill with a pine tree at the bottom. And these hills are all over the, all over the mountains. If you've ever hiked anywhere, you just take the e-brake off, no one's around and it's crashed into a tree. So if that was the idea. And then Mora couldn't get her car started right here. Right. Cause otherwise she would have drove away. By the time she gets on the bus, she's like, I can't go back to the car. It doesn't start anyways. Like this is it. Let's just do it now. I, 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 sorry to, sorry if I missed it. Um, why wouldn't this plan be put into place in Massachusetts? And why, why does she have to drive like three hours to, to put a plan into place? I think it's because she doesn't want to have to bring the car back to Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, theoretically, anywhere she goes, a local tow to bring the car back and inspect it. If she's in New Hampshire and she writes off the car, there's a chance it never makes it back to Massachusetts. So later, when they're actually checking out Vassie and stuff and putting this together, they don't have the car anymore. 
it's in New Hampshire. And who's going to, who's going to do that operation? But, but the New Hampshire state line is uh, like 45 minutes or an hour from Amherst. And, uh, she was driving for three hours. Also the Connecticut state line is I think even closer than the New Hampshire state line and the New Hampshire state line and the Vermont state line are very close. So I guess the point is there is like three other options off the top of my head. If you're going to drop that in a different state for the purposes you're saying. But do they have a hostel nearby for a person operating in cash? I would I would argue there's some connection to the White Mountains other than just like a hostel if you're going to go there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool. I'm down. Like, I am not married to this theory. I've just had no one to talk about it with ever. I, I, I'm with you on taking it to New Hampshire because if they're actually concocting a plan Saturday night, then they have to say, well, wherever you're going, wherever the car is going to be, wh- wherever you're going to roll it down the hill, you it can't be arbitrary. So where do you know? You know, you know, you you know, New Hampshire. We go there. You the the cabins there. The track team had the cabin there. So. Uh, she puts in a couple of calls to make it look like um, she's going to Bretton Woods or look like she's inquiring on places to stay, takes out some money, buys some alcohol, makes it look like, you know, there's going to be a party. So, but this, and this is where I'm going to ditch my car. And that's part of the plan. So um, I, I'm not saying that's what happened. I, I feel like I really need to like emphasize that, that I'm not saying that's what happened, but I follow your train of thought on that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to be very clinical about this. Like, you guys definitely um, reel me back in. You know? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, the impact and the tree and this suspicion here. I just think, like, a bus driver with, um, you know, Butch has got a mother in law enforcement, which we'll get to at the end. A bus driver who's been doing this for a while and everything, like, you're pretty specific about details and getting things right. So, unless someone could show me a pine tree at that corner, that'll always be a problem for me. Like I just will never be able to write off the pine tree um, because especially the way that the community gets so, so obsessed with the, the tree. Like, you know, there's a lot about the tree. I mean, it was either one big tree or it was a tree stand back or like most of the investigators who've looked at it since agree there was no tree. So you either have to make your own conclusion or you have to, Accept the lie. And I, I don't accept Butch Atwood's lie that he hit a pine tree. And so that's partly why I, I've gotten here. And the reason Fred would have missed that is because that worked for Fred at the time. And if it was what they planned on Saturday night, Fred rolled up on the scene thinking, this is an odd spot for Maura to pick, but this is what she picked. Like, I, and so Fred never got really into why Butch said pine tree, because I think Fred felt like that was one of Maura's last intentions coming through there. So go ahead. Okay, I just uh, I attached a screenshot here from this drone video here in this uh, Zoom chat. Um, if you want to take a quick look at it, it's uh, it's a screenshot from from our drone video over the crash site. So you can see um, trees. I don't know if they're pine trees or not. They, I mean, they kind of look like pine trees to me. That's probably what I would have said. Um, now I always kind of had a, in like a little bit of an issue with where the car supposedly was versus where the curve is. Um, that always seemed like it was a little further than it should have been, um, closer to those trees than the curve. Um, so I, so I don't know. I, it, it does look like there's pine trees there, not so much on the corner, but a little bit closer to Butch's house. Yeah. Okay, I'll grant you that. I that's just where we disagree. Um, and uh, but I also disagree with Renner, who says that she clipped this corner of the snowbank, and that's how the damage happened. So we are going to disagree. That's going to happen, um, and it's perfectly fine. And you're an idiot because you disagree. <laughs> okay, excuse me. At <laughs> seven forty-four, dispatch notifies Cecil he's looking for a single female. At seven forty-five, Butch goes back to the bus. Now there are two accounts of this. There's one that Cecil met Butch on the bus. And there's another account that Cecil and Butch met just outside Butch's door and then Butch walked to the bus. I think that's the one I heard. So, sorry, I never heard the one Cecil came on the bus. No, he goes up to the bus door. Oh, and okay. Butch opens the bus door and he, they talk, you know, like that. And I feel like more is a few seats back when that conversation happens and Butch is making sure to sit on that bus so that Cecil doesn't come through um, to look on it. But also... In a case like this, in a small town, you're not thinking missing persons. You're not thinking national news. You're not thinking like that. You're all, you're just thinking, ah, this is a little mischief. And so when you go talk to the bus driver, you're talking to your peer in the community. You're not talking to someone who would potentially lie to you. 
I argue from my experience growing up in a small town that that's exactly what happens. I knew on my road, if the cops were coming by and I was driving my dirt bike, which houses I could hide in. I could just drive my dirt bike into their yard behind their garage and chill for a minute until the cops left. I know that the, Mr. Brown, the caretaker was one of them. I know the bus driver was one of them. I knew her and she, she knew the police. And you know, there's also houses I knew not to go to, but I just think that's more small town thing than people think people realize, you know, Cecil arrives, asks, where's the girl? And Atwood denies knowing anything. So 7.55 after a few minutes discussion, Atwood and Cecil go looking for Mara. It shows how much Cecil trusted Atwood by the mere fact that Atwood is part of the search. You can see that trust in action. So that's not normal. And by the way, why would Atwood think Mora would get in with him the second time? Remember, she denied him the first time. So he thinks that after 15 minutes and her running away, if he rolls up on her a second time, she'll say, I'll get in this time. Like, I just don't see why he would even go out at all. Like, the cops Well, I mean, he's, he, he's probably not going to say no to, to Cecil. I think I argue he's, he's running it. I argue, and this is where we'll get, not that he's running the search, but I, I always had a suspicion that uh, Cecil went uh, west um, and Atwood went east because I believe everything Atwood says is a lie. And so I could never confirm that. I was like, I know they would split up. There's no way that the bus driver and the cop would go in the same direction. I found it on like a 29 page uh, article. I think it was like Soka or something. It says, in fact, Cecil went west. So somehow Cecil went the same direction Mora was coming from. Who would be responsible for that? I doubt it would be Cecil. I think it would be Atwood. Atwood would say, you go the way she's facing. Because there's just no reason that a cop would go that way. He just came from that way. But it's I just think nonsensical it, to me. Yeah, that, that is kind of a common um, complaint that no one went east. And, uh, and I think the jurisdictional line is right there. Um, after uh, Butch's property and right around Bradley Hill Road because the further you go east um, towards Lincoln, towards Woodstock, that is all state road. So then maybe it was Cecil's, uh, Cecil said, I'll go back in my jurisdiction. Um, and then maybe that's why he would, he would say, potentially you go the other way because that's not my jurisdiction. That's but a bus driver's territory now. <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't Butch say that he... Butch did say, though, that he went west and, and went around French Pond Road, right? So I don't think that Atwood went the same direction. He also says in an interview with that year that he thinks she went up to Vermont. So it's like either Atwood is following the case very closely and he's watching the news articles that say she checked into she checked out a hotel in Vermont, or Atwood's sending you left while you're looking right again. He's doing it all the time. And so that is why I think that the police eventually search French Pond is because they start to catch on to Atwood. And I'm going to get there right away. 